Richard and Christian. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to do a quick little read of the bios, and we will get started after that. All right. Uh, Christian McEwen is a writer, educator, and cultural activist. Since leaving New York City 20 years ago, she has edited two anthologies and produced a video documentary, Tomboys, and a play, Legal Tender, Women, and the Secret Life of Money. Her book, World Enough and Time on Creativity and Slowing Down, is now in its sixth printing, which is amazing, and is also available in an audio format. Her most recent collection, Sparks from the Anvil, the Smith College Poetry interviews appeared in spring 2015. Christian grew up in the borders of Scotland and now lives in Western Massachusetts. And Richard Smith's first book, Not a Soul But Us, is a narrative in sonnets about the plague pandemic in mid 14th century England. It won the 2021 May Sarton New Hampshire Poetry Prize and was published in 2022 by Bauhan Publishing. I believe I said that correctly. His next project is another sonnet narrative about a group of Tudor era Benedictine monks before, during, and after Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. Richard is a clinical psychologist with a private practice in Washington, D.C., and I had to be careful in those Roman numerals because I can't just read those without thinking. So uh, Richard, I believe you're up first. I'm happy to hand off to you and I will be back in a few minutes for a Q&A. So enjoy, enjoy the reading, everyone. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, Zach, am I coming through okay? All clear. Okay. Um, oh, and especially thank you all for coming. I don't know everybody's here, but as uh, we were starting up, I could see, oh, people who've known me my whole life, like older sisters, a friend from grade school, Linda Fleet Perry, lots of friends from college, from all stages of my career, different places I've lived. Thank you all. Delightful to have you here. Um, I'm going to read first from my book, Not a Soul But Us, which was published almost two years ago now. As Zach said, it's a um, narrative in sonnets. I'm reading from the start, so you don't need any backstory. All you need to know is that um, we, we are in Yorkshire in autumn 1349. Our village, plague's been here since summer. Me, I'm 12. My family, no one left now. No more food. Walk, manor, sheepfold, gate. You see me wag your tail, bark. The steward turns. So, your father? Nod. The flock, he gestures. You went with, he taught you? Nod. He hands me bread. Tomorrow, take them up. You herd me to the barn and paw up hay to make our bed. I eat and give you half. You're close all night. Being warm and touched reminds me how to sleep. I dream my father's hands. By the time it's light, mine know just how to move. Palm raised, you leap up, point, you run outside. What's left to do but follow? No one's claiming me but you. A half cut field, the flock can graze here. Yet, you pause, flies buzz, there's something rotting. Smears of blood across his face and hands, the dead man almost trips me. And then I'm not quite here, I'm back two days ago, that morning back at home. I woke when something smacked my head. My father raised the broom, another thwack and coughed. Blood sprayed. Get out, he heaved from bed. Don't die with me, he hit and hit. You're young, he drove me from the house and blocked the door. Set fire to the place he called, then run. You might just live. I stumbled, lay there for an hour, a night, a day, right where I dropped. His coughing rattled, faded, slowed, paused, stopped. Then I come back to here, this field, the dead man, you, the flock. It strikes me, we must leave, we must leave now. I point, you turn your head and bark the sheep toward home. I wipe my sleeve across my eyes. Uh, my mouth is making sounds that tell you something's very wrong. Now all of us, sheep, you, me, 
go careening down the hill. I slip and flounder, twice I fall, but soon we're back inside the fold. I've cut my hand. You sniff the wound, then lick. Your tongue so slow and soft, it's like, I can't think what, just something that felt good when I was young. The bleeding stops. My skin is clean and smooth, yet you keep licking. I don't want to move. Next morning starts so fine that I forget to watch the sky. Instead, I think up names to help me keep track of the sheep. Lisbeth, Aline, Matilda, Walter, Catherine, James, Susanna. Then I notice sleet's begun. The clouds are low and dark. You're barking from way up the ridge. I make my count and one isn't here. I bark, pursue your answer. Come to where you guard a lamb whose foot got stuck between two rocks. He bleats and tugs. I hold him firm and ease him free and bless our luck we've lost no one. He shakes with fear or cold. I pick him up. He settles, tucks his head in close and rides me home. Mine Edward, Ned. The church bells haven't chimed for weeks, since June, July. At first, each soul was rung to rest till I heard nine in just one afternoon. The next day, silence. Maybe it seemed best to keep the number from us. Maybe no one was alive to ring the bell, just as, just as no one was left to take the bodies. So I helped my father carry ours out past the churchyard to the pit where they got stacked. One family died together. Neighbors tried setting fire to that one house. With houses packed so close, though, flames spread fast, more burned, more died. But our house stood alone out on high ground. It wasn't dangerous to burn it down. The priest says, God sent plague to punish sin. Our first was Hugh, my little brother, two years old. He burned with fever, half his skin blue black, his nose all bloody, screaming through that night. What was his sin, I said. A hiss, my mother slapped me, blasphemy, don't dare, the Lord will strike. My father grabbed her wrist. Enough, he warned, she stopped. He stroked my hair. But she was right. God struck. I'm cursed. I am a curse. I won't come near a soul but you. Since you're not human, maybe you're not damned for staying by my side. I hope that's true. Each morning I wake up before it's light. You round up all the sheep. We take our flight. We're back by dark. Outside the kitchen, there's a basket where the steward leaves our bread. I break it, half for morning, half we share inside the barn before we go to bed. We lie the way we did when you were small and didn't have to go and guard the sheep. Your spine against my chest, paws, hands, feet, all mixed up. On some nights, when you're fast asleep, you dream of running, twitch and whimper till I rock you. Some nights, my own dreaming wakes me, leaves me shuddering like I've caught a chill. You lick my fingers till they do not shake, and then you lick my palms, and then my wrists, and then I fall asleep again. The ewes are all in heat. The rams are all berserk. The oldest clambers awkwardly onto a ewe who twists away. He falls off sideways, grunting. Suddenly I see, recall, my father, down on hands and knees to ape this clown. He'd mount a stool and whack and poke and pant and thrust and groan and wheeze. And then he'd play the ewe, board sigh, glance back, return to grazing. Mother'd laugh so hard she'd hide her face, but still the tears streamed through her fingers. It's just me now in this yard, and sheep who don't know they were mocked, 
and you the only thing of mine that isn't gone. The rams spent wander off. The ewes graze on. The morning's misty. House and barn and gate all fade toward nothing as we walk uphill. Somebody calls my name, but I don't wait. I run and fast, and so do you, until the voice stops. I'm not sure just why I run. Could be I've kept alone so long that I have lost the knack for being looked at. Sun burns off the mist. We find a field that's dry, I breathe. That night, we're quiet as we go toward the kitchen. Something isn't right. No waft of smoke, no hum of voices, no clink clank of pots, no door outline of light. I reach inside the basket, shake my head. You stare, I think you smell it. There's no bread. I touch the door. It swings wide open, dark and moonlight. Hot, strewn, chairs tipped over like the people stood up fast. Hearths cold, no spark. I find a candle, steel, and flint, and strike some light. We tiptoe on into the hall, high ceilinged, loud with silence. From outside, I used to hear men laugh and sing and call each other names and bang their plates and fight. And now I'm inside. In the stillness, you beside me, passing benches, tables, one more door, my Lord's room. Blankets, pillows, shoes lie scattered. Packing up to leave was done, it seems, in one big burst of rush and fuss. And no one stayed. There's not a soul but us. I will stop there, um, the next 74 sonnets. Tell you what he did after that. Um, as Zach mentioned, I'm working on another sonnet narrative. Um, it is so imagine jumping forward 170 years in time from Yorkshire to Dorsetshire um, to a monastery. And um, it's January in 1519. The first thing that I notice is your hands, big knobby knuckles, long thick fingers made for work, but spared so far, unscarred, untanned, as if some dream fogged toolsmith carved a spade of ivory. Then you speak, a voice that comes from somewhere deep inside. So what we hear is gentle, muffled, like the wind that hums me wide awake these scant few hours when we're allowed to sleep before we pray again. I long to creep from bread and slip outdoors, forsake the chants, the aves, the amens, and let the wind peruse me, hands like yours upon my back, hair, face, untrammeled, wild. I scarcely have been touched since I was a child. I started off being left behind a knot of squalling flesh in bloody rags, a trail of bloody handprints toward the forest, not one clue whose blood this was, who'd left this frail new soul for monks to baptize, clothe, feed, teach. The brother said that God had brought me. You though, middling lord's last son, the day you reach 19, your father sloughs you off out to this monastery, thanking us with gold so no one pesters him about your keep. Did you want this? I guess you were just told that now you'd leave your home and come here, sleep here, live and die here in this paltry place. No wonder so much hides behind your face. Your father's steward clinks the bag down on the table. Count it. You seem not to breathe. Dear sir, says Father Walter dryly, we've no need to count. He pats your shoulder, steers you toward me. Simon, they show Philip round the abbey. You two, you will share this year as brother novices. I lead you down the steps. 
He tapped my wrist. Please, let me say goodbye to Rose. We dart out to the yard. A brown mare tethered near the stable neighs and strains to reach you. You step over, start to murmur, stroke her cheek. I turn. It would be cold to watch. You're losing her for good. Yet for one breath, I see the way you touch your horse's face. And now my face can feel that. Feel your skin upon my skin, as much as if your hand had soothed me in the real world. Then you're here beside me, just within the doorway to the cloister. Marjoram and hyssop. That's what's wafting from your skin? Perhaps the thick black hair that sways down from your cap. Perhaps your doublet or your cloak. I'm robed and tonsured, scalp shaved bald, but for a ring of orange fuzz, a goose egg's yolk smeared round my skull. I turn and lock the door behind us, step into the Western walk and say, inside the cloister, we don't talk. Your eyes mark where I hang the key up near the door. This isn't prison, I explain. You're free to leave till we take vows next year. And then it's just those vows that will contain us here. Around the corner, someone's pen is scratching. Mass is being sung in church to help free souls in purgatory. Then there's arguing in the northern walk. It lurched across this yard, wings flapping, Martin claims. Oh, what's flapping is that thing between your ears, groans Prior Gilbert. Don't you have more shame? Your claptrap is the only demon here. We stand in shadow. They can't see us. You say, so we don't talk here, and yet we do. I answer, hold a rule too tight. It dies for want of air. You seem surprised. I'm pleased you dared poke fun. You say, I'll need advice on which rules breathe, which don't. You're more at ease. You let your eyes meander up toward a window. That's where visitors stay. Below the almondry, I say. It's where we store what's given to the poor, spare food, old clothes. Beside it's the refectory. We eat in silence, you just grin. We stroll. The day room's where we talk, the one place where there's heat. The chapter house, the stairs that lead the way up to the dormitory where we sleep. You ask, what's mine? There's nothing I will keep. You stare at all the beds. I say, we share all things just like the first apostles. What you need, you'll get. To eat, to read, to wear. I understand you can't yet feel it, but I hope that someday this will comfort you. You almost hide a sigh. Beyond the beds, I point back toward a door that leads into the necessarium. You cock your head, perplexed. Then, oh, latrines. I should have guessed we shit in Latin. Thus the sparrow finds his home, I quote. The swallow makes his nest, you add. Psalm 84, verse 3. Our minds lock eyes. What's sacred and what's silly blur. That may be why we laugh. I'm not quite sure. And something seems about to happen. Then it waits. I recollect myself. This way, the night stairs lead down to the choir for when we rise to greet the first hour of the day. At dawn, at midnight. Floor tiles laid down in a darker color than the rest mark out a pathway to our stalls. The hush begins. I see you feel the place. You walk about, then sit and hum three notes. The echo, you exclaim. I point, the grate beneath you? Down below is a pit that's lined with stones. Bricks too, I think. You smile. That's why there's so much sound. You're glowing. Maybe music is the thing most helps you pray. I say, perhaps you'd sing? You flush, both shy and glad I've asked. You stand, you start. If it had shape, your voice would make a perfect sphere. If texture, 
soft, a hand whose pressure reassures. If feeling, ache and wish. If color, blue, the deepening blue when twilight's almost over, blue that would be black if black could shimmer. Somehow, you sound near and far at once, as if I stood right by a cave where you were hiding. Notes rise higher. Day by day we bless you. Yet your voice stays round and full, as if it floats at peace on currents steadied by God's breath. You finish and glance toward me, hopeful, meek. I nod. It would be sacrilege to speak. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Um, you are in for a treat. Kristen McEwen's book, In Praise of Listening, is just lovely, um, completely lovely. And as I told her, it encouraged me in daily life to cultivate a habit of simply listening to what's around me. And I, it was extraordinary to the extent to which that was calming. And then also, and this surprised me the most, very interesting. Um, so, Christian, off to you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody else who showed up on this screen this afternoon when so much else is going on. Um, I just want to make a tiny correction to my bio. Uh, my latest book is not the book that uh, was mentioned that came out in 2015. It's the new book, which is the one that Richard was just now talking about. It's called In Praise of Listening, A Gathering of Stories. And that's what I'm going to be reading from today. What is lost? In the summer of 2015, Oliver Sacks wrote a short essay called The Machine Stops, which later appeared in The New Yorker. Sacks was a writer and neurologist, best known for awakenings and the man who mistook his wife for a hat, as well as a lively and surprising memoir, on the move. He was above all an enthusiast with a brilliant, original, astonishingly well-stocked mind. But what he saw as he left his apartment and moved out into the New York City streets had begun to trouble him. People peering into little boxes or holding them in front of their faces, walking blithely in the path of moving traffic, totally out of touch with their surroundings. Young parents staring at their cell phones and ignoring their own babies as they walk or wheel them along. At 21 years old, I traveled around the States on a Greyhound bus, enjoying many lively conversations along the way. On that same bus now, passengers barely raise their eyes from their tiny screens. The willingness to be open to a casual encounter, to trade impressions with a stranger, has almost completely disappeared. More subtle forms of listening are also under siege, from private wool gathering or rumination, to communing with the past or the beloved dead, to the many pleasures that reside in silence. The immediate present is undermined, perforated by a sense of elsewhere, writes Sven Burkertz in Changing the Subject, Art and Attention in the Internet Age. Always drawn toward the latest piece of news, the latest bleep, our attention is splintered, fragmented, broken up. In a recent interview, the poet Joy Harjo spoke of trying to protect her own creative focus. She was working at her desk when she heard a ding from her computer and realized she'd responded like one of Pavlov's dogs. It shocked her, she said. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to stay on the track of my listening. It made her wonder why she was reacting in that way. But of course she knew the reason all too well. Somebody is hungry for money. So if they keep you there with those sounds, then they'll have your attention. And your attention means money for them. In a world where the airwaves, all the airwaves are increasingly choked with noise, that battle for our attention has now reached a crescendo. Sachs and Burkett's are not alone in trying to sound a warning. Over the last decade, the number of thoughtful escape manuals has continued to proliferate. Early classics included Nicholas Carr's The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, and William Power's Hamlet's Blackberry, 
Building a Good Life in the Digital Age, followed more recently by Cal Newport's Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World, Jenny O'Dell's How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, Catherine Price's How to Break Up with Your Phone, The 30-Day Plan to Take Back Your Life, and Johan Hari's Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. Price states the issue with heartbreaking clarity. Our attention is the most valuable thing we have, she says. We experience only what we pay attention to. When we decide what to pay attention to in the moment, we're making a broader decision about how we want to spend our lives. A space to be explored. I grew up in Scotland, in the country, in what now seems a remarkably self-contained old-fashioned household. My brothers and sisters and I were brought up to be polite, to say please and thank you. But we talked one way upstairs in the nursery and another way downstairs with the grown-ups, one way with our parents and another way with the women who cleaned the house or scoured the vegetables. There were subjects that we never thought to raise, questions that we simply did not ask. Class, however muffled, quiescent, maintained its own authority. At 16, fresh out of boarding school, I set out hitch hitchhiking for the first time. In the years that followed, I hitched from Dublin to the west of Ireland, from Amsterdam to the south of France, from Cambridge back and forth to London, talking and asking questions all the way. I was curious about everyone and everything, and for the first time that curiosity was being seen as welcome. People wanted to respond. I remember sitting high up in the cab of an enormous lorry, barreling across Ireland, while the driver told me the story of his life. I remember the young couple who picked me up in France and drove me almost to my door, the warmth and hilarity inside their tiny car, the smell of coffee and fresh air and cigarettes. And I remember the joy of those transient exchanges, the sense that even as strangers we could find a way to talk to one another, that there'd always be something more to be explored. Half a lifetime later, gathering material for a new book, I thought again about those marvellous free-ranging conversations and how they might differ from more considered kinds of listening, in particular the formal interview. I was meeting with lots of people at the time, writers and artists, stories, storytellers and musicians, and asking them to talk to me about their work. To start with, I hardly knew what I was trying to accomplish. But gradually I came to see that whatever my final purpose, a handful of lively quotes, a lengthy interview, it was up to me to create a certain ease and spaciousness, a certain level of courtesy and respect. Only then could I hope for the kind of exchange that pleased me most, rich, expansive, ultimately transformative, not just for me as interlocutor, but for the speaker too. When we are listened to, writes Brenda Euland, it creates us, makes us unfold and expand. Ideas actually begin to grow within us and to come to life. I experienced this for myself, both in my initial project, World Enough and Time on Creativity and Slowing Down, and in the one that followed, later published as Sparks from the Anvil, the Smith College Poetry Interviews. For the most part, I was ridiculously well prepared. But often there was such a hunger to tell on the part of the poets that all I had to do was hold the space as each one descended ever deeper into his or her own story. Our small recording booth became a magic portal through which they spoke to the future, claiming their legacy, addressing readers and admirers they would never meet. They could perhaps have done this on their own, supported only by the microphone and its associated machinery. But there could be no doubt that my company, my listening ear, but provide some of the impetus they needed. I think especially of my conversation with the African-American poet Aracelis Girmay, how she'd pause a moment before responding to my questions, listening inward, discovering what she had to say. I myself was almost dissolved inside her process. When I opened the door of the recording booth, the two of us looked back at one another, dazed and grateful, as if we'd been spinning off together into outer space. 
So this book, um, In Praise of Listening, has about 13 different chapters. Starts with listening to childhood, goes on through human voice. And then there are sections on little sounds of every day and on listening to the wild, listening to the spirit, communing with the dead. The next section I want to read to you is, is from the chapter called The Little Things, Little Sounds of Every Day. And it's called Alice's Kitchen. And it's about listening to food. Alice Cosolino is an extraordinary cook. One might almost call her a food whisperer. For most of her life, she's thought of herself as one who feeds. It's a skill that reaches back to very early childhood. When Alice was a girl, she and her mother would make pasta fagioli every week. The night before, the two of them would sit together in the kitchen, sorting beans. Her mother would pour them out across the table, the pea beans and the lentils and the navy beans, all mixed up together, making one pile for Alice and another for herself. Then, taking ten or twelve at a time, they would shh and drop them into shiny metal bowls. The aim was to separate out the little bits of stone or grit, the less than ideal specimens. Her mother wanted each bean to be perfect. Shh and drop, shh and drop, shh and drop, Alice murmurs. Even now the sound carries her back in time, back to herself at five and six years old. More than anything in the world, she says, that sound transports me. Cosolino is in her 60s now, a sturdy, handsome woman with a mane of long grey hair and warm brown eyes. When I ask her to name her favourite sounds, she comes up with a long list, starting with any kind of bird call and moving on through frogs and crickets and squirrels to the wind in the trees and water dripping, flowing. She loves interior sounds as well, almost any sound in the kitchen, even the clanging of pots, spoons against the rim, pouring pasta in a colander, hearing the water gush and then slowly trickle through the small holes into the sink, the sound of food sautéing in hot oil. Come to your senses, she tells her students. Come to your senses in my kitchen. Listening to food is something Cosolino discovered for herself. No one ever taught it to me, she says. I never read of it. But as she became more centred in her daily life, she found ways to translate. Excuse me, I lost my world, my world here. Come on. It went too fast. As she became more centred in her daily life, she found ways to translate her meditative practice into the act of cooking. As we speak, she talks me through the preparations for an imagined meal. Listen to the onions now, she says. That oil is hot, so listen to the sound of the onions hitting the hot oil. If it doesn't sizzle, the oil isn't hot enough. Smell what that smells like. There's an acridness, a sharpness. And then, once some time has passed, now listen to the onions. They're juicy. It's going shh, shh, shh. It's a wet sound, where before it was dry. Smell the onions. It's a rounder aroma. It's not sharp. It's round. Look, it's reduced in volume from six cups to three. The acids transform the sugars in response to the heat, changing the molecular structure and the flavour too, from acrid to sweet. Soon after that, the onions will begin to stick. A less experienced chef might reach for a wooden spoon and start to stir. But from Cosolino's point of view, that would be a mistake. Both ear and eye remind her to leave the onions to themselves. There's a French term called the fond, and the fond is treasured, she says. If you add any acidic ingredient, dry sherry, or a little splash of vinegar, or some lemon juice, the acid will react with the fond, and it will be released from the pan, creating a richly flavoured dark brown gravy. I asked Cosolina how she might teach someone else to cook like this. It's very tricky, she says, because it has to do with actively choosing to surrender, which is an oxymoron. The challenge is to bring her students back to center, returning them to their senses time after time. Touch the food, she tells them. What does it feel like? What does it look like? What do you smell? She might do that three times in one minute. Taste, smell, look, listen. Over and over and over and over. 
Such concentrated focus does not come easily, even cause for Cosalina. Listening takes quiet, she says. It takes time. You can't listen quickly. She quotes research that emphasizes the growing impatience of most Western consumers, the addiction to the instantaneous. From her point of view, that's the antithesis of listening. Listening requires us to take a breath. It requires us to pause. Cosalino's partner, Amy Pulley, is especially skilled at this. The two have been together for more than 40 years, but even now Cosalino responds to her with loving wonderment. My beloved Amy, who will allow the act of listening to supersede in importance anything else around her. She describes how Pulley's head cocks to one side as she listens, eyes wide open, gazing deeply inwards. Whoa, what's she looking at, asks Cosalina. Watching Pulley has taught her just how crucial that listening can be. In Mark Nepo's words, patience, the art of waiting, is the heart skill that opens the world. I think there's time for me to read you two more little sections. The next one is um, about John Muir, with whom I share a birthday and who was born in Scotland, very close to where I grew up. I grew up in the borders of Scotland. This section is called Mountain Truths. John Muir was born in Dunbar, Scotland in 1838 and died in Los Angeles on Christmas Eve, 1914. His father was a strict Presbyterian and required him to learn a certain number of Bible verses every day on peril of a whipping. By the time Muir was 11, he had about three fourths of the Old Testament and all of the new by heart and sore flesh. He continued to read the Bible deep into old age. Nonetheless, the lean, sinewy man with the bright blue eyes and the long reddish beard can more easily be seen as a wandering monk or nature mystic than as the reputable scion of an evangelical church. As a young man, Muir walked from Kentucky to Florida, keeping a journal along the way. He arrived in California in 1868 and became a noted writer, botanist and conservationist working to create Yosemite National Park and founding the Sierra Club. All his life, he remained curious and adventurous, brimful of gusto and enthusiasm. Though he loved his wife and daughters and was a loyal friend, he also found great pleasure in his own good company, whether taking a sled, round down a sled ride down a glacier, slipping behind the rushing water of Yosemite Falls, or climbing a Douglas fir in the midst of a tremendous storm. There was no such thing as solitude as far as he, he was concerned. Even when he was tramping the Sierra on his own, the rocks and trees and water were a shining company of friends. Plants are credited with but a dim and uncertain sensation, he wrote, and minerals with positively none at all. But may not even a mineral arrangement of matter be endowed with sensation of a kind? He thought of rocks as having a certain gentle interiority or instonation and suggested that instead of walking on them as unfeeling surfaces, we should instead regard them as transparent sky. Whether rocks spoke to him with audible voice or pulsed with common motion, he was eager to listen and translate, to spell out some of the mountain truths he had discovered. Muir was known in human company as a non-stop talker, and it makes sense that he'd converse with plants and flowers too. When I discovered a new plant, I sat down beside it for a minute or a day to make its acquaintance and try to hear what it had to say. At times he would conduct a regular interrogation. I said, how came you here? How do you live through the winter? And the plants revealed their secret. Nor were his encounters always so sedate. A missionary friend in Alaska remembered Muir running from one cluster of flowers to another, falling to his knees in an ecstasy of admiration as he greeted each new bloom in a mixture of scientific nomenclature and delighted baby talk, all in a broad Scots accent. The Calvinists of his youth would have disdained such giddiness, seeing the glories of the natural world as fated for destruction and Muir's exuberance as an offence against the Lord. But Muir himself had long since cast off such gloomy tenets, imagining a wild heart like his own in every cell and sparkling crystal, and addressing plants and animals as 
friendly fellow mountaineers. He brought such imaginative identification to larger species too, remembering individual trees with great precision and well able to distinguish the sharp hiss and rustle of the wind in the glossy leaves of the pine oaks from the soft, sifting, hushing tones of the pines, and to orient himself, even at night, by the sounds of the wind as it played through the pine needles. There was no end to his attentive listening or his willingness to be delighted and astonished. As long as I live, he wrote, I'll hear waterfalls and birds and winds sing. I'll interpret the rocks, learn the language of flood, storm, avalanche. Or as he scrawled in one of the margins of his favorite books, not the Bible this time, but a volume of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Between every pine tree, there is a door leading to a new way of life. So one more little section. This is the very last section of the book and it's called The Music of What, what Happens. It was an ordinary Saturday in a small New England town. Someone was playing banjo on the porch of the local store and someone else was playing fiddle. A modest crowd had gathered, most of them elderly or middle-aged. Among them was a pretty fair-haired child, perhaps four years old, in bright pink leggings and a butterfly t-shirt. Whose child was she? I had no idea. The grown-ups smiled and listened, tapped their feet. The musicians went on playing. Meanwhile, the child was dancing, delighted, unselfconscious, turning happy circles in the dusty street. Swifts flew back and forth between the wooden pillars of the porch and out again into the open sky. It was a moment to be treasured, delicate and transient, like something from a haiku. I thought of it often in the years that followed, when COVID made us wary of the smallest gathering, and even that bright sprite would have been masked. But the long months of the pandemic had their gifts as well. With schools and colleges almost entirely under lockdown, let alone offices and factories, churches and cinemas, restaurants and galleries and concert halls, listening became ever more essential. Listening to one's friends and family via phone or Skype or Zoom, listening inwards, listening to the body, listening to the surrounding world. Any one of those could open into what one might call a larger listening, a way to honour and welcome and slow down and pay attention until there was nothing and no one that was not of interest. What is the finest music of the world, someone asks in one of the old Irish folk tales. The cuckoo calling from the highest tree, says the young Oshin. The ring of a spear against a shield, says his son, Oscar. And the other warriors join in. The belling of a stag, the song of a lark, the laugh of a gleeful girl. Until finally it is the turn of the great Finn McCool. The music of what happens, he declares. That is the finest music in the world. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And we do have some time for a little bit of Q&A. Unfortunately, we have our first question in the chat window. If anyone has any questions, though, please type them in the chat window and I will read them out and ask our our readers, our authors to, to share their answers. So the, Richard, the first one's for you. What was your inspiration to put yourself in the mind of those agent people? And I think that's a really interesting one. Oh, um, uh, escape <laughs> um, from the present. Um, since I was a kid, I've had a mental picture of a medieval peasant standing in a field looking at a church spire. And I don't know where that came from, but I've had the question, what was it like to be that person? And um, some of my family members are here. Um, my family is rotten with helping professionals, just teeming with them, because we're all essentially incredibly nosy um, about other people. <laughs> Our mom used to stand in the living room window with binoculars and scan the neighborhood just to see what was going on. But I think for me, the most, one of the very most interesting questions in the world is what is it like to be somebody else? And um, it's certainly probably why I'm a psychologist and do psychotherapy for a living. 
culturally, periods mm, up to including the early modern period are fascinating because it's still human beings, but there were things about the world, cultural assumptions, beliefs, that had to make life feel very different. Um, specifically, uh, in you know, in, in England during these both these periods, Christianity, um, and I'm just curious to understand what did it feel like to live inside a world like that, and what did it feel like when you're living in a world that was supposed to be ordered and benevolent, when that world became horribly chaotic and malevolent, and how did you think about it? Thank you, Richard. There've been a couple of questions about. First one was why sonnet form. The second one was, can you talk about your use of iambic pentameter, iambic pentameter sonnet form, uh, and how that both constrains and facilitates your poetry? So, why in the first place, and then how does that affect? Um, I was listening to a lecture about Romeo and Juliet, and was reminded that when they meet, they co-create a sonnet spontaneously. Their first exchange of lines is a sonnet. Romeo speaks four, Juliet speaks four, then I think it's two and two. And they start to make a second sonnet, but the nurse interrupts and calls Juliet away. So I was thinking about that. Uh, my partner and I had recently gotten our first dog. And I thought, well, I love Barney. I can write sonnets for Barney, our dog. And so I did start writing sonnets for Barney. And in one, I imagined us as... Um, a medieval shepherd and his dog. And then to sort of raise the stakes on that relationship, I made it into um, a kid abandoned during the Black Death. It, the form, I've always found it interesting. It's sort of like a puzzle. Um, the real question is, why did I keep on writing, writing sonnets? There were a whole bunch of things. In writing a narrative in sonnets, there's a huge flexibility in I can have isolated incidents that are just a sonnet long. I can have sequences that are several sonnets long. I can leave out a lot of the connective tissue that prose holds, um, and that's a relief. I like the discipline of 140 syllables per sonnet. Um, and the way I thought of it, I thought of it several ways. Um, a friend of mine who I think is on, if Mary's here, uh, weaves and she's described how when she sits down to weave the process requires so much care and detail that it's very soothing and i find that with sonnets that making the rhymes making the rhythm is such a, an intricate process that it slows me way down the second thought is that um writing a sonnet is like um instead of dancing alone with no structure dancing with a partner who is way more experienced and talented than I am, which forces me to be better. And I find that the strictures of the form require being really economical, exactly what I wanna say. I can't get away with it being imprecise. Um, and as to the iambic pentameter, um, I love that pulse. There's a theater in Stanton, Virginia, the American Shakespeare Center, where they work on original Shakespeare practices, and they do an incredibly good job with iambic pentameter. Um, and it is the pulse of a heartbeat. Um, these actors at the theater have said that they can do about 20 lines per minute, which ends up being 100 beats per minute, which is sort of your heart rate when you're having a moderate or brisk walk. So there's something about the pulse that I think engages the reader subliminally, which I like. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump down to one a question for Christian. Uh, what are your personal disciplines for honing the art of listening? Honing the art of... What was your question? Uh, what are your personal disciplines for honing the art of listening? I guess, how do you hone the art of listening? <laughs> Before I answer that, I just want to say... Um, Richard, that reading was so wonderful, and I'm I'm very um, I'm delighted by the way the formality of the son the sonnet allows you such precision in in your physical world. I mean, there's so such it, it it's so it feels as you listen so effortless, 
and I know it isn't, but it's, it's beautifully, beautifully crafted. Thank you. Um, I think I'm still learning to be a good listener. I really do. Um, and perhaps that long progression of writing the book taught me a little bit. I mean, the, probably the first lesson as a listener is not to is not to jump in with what you think you've got to say. I mean, just to just to pause, just to pause and really believe that the other person has something new to say and not that their speech is the reason for you to hook on with your own story. I mean, really make the space. And often if you make the space, something surprising will happen. And then and then you too are, are surprised. You know, you don't just get to say the thing you know already that you're so delighted to thrust down the throat of the other person. <laughs> So that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, Richard, to you, can you talk a little bit about your research process and how you go about immersing yourself in the research and in these foreign worlds? Uh, read a ton. <laughs> um, and um, follow rabbit holes in reading. Um, and specifically, uh, well, try to understand the period, how people thought. Also look for any physical details that I can use because that's always um, a great gift. Um, the, the latrines really were called the necessarium. There really were different colors of tiles and marking where the monks should go to um, do their services. Uh, there, and every physical detail is just a gift. Um, so it's a, it's a a lot of reading. I've probably read a hundred books for the new book so far. Um, and some of it's very tedious. <laughs> <laughs> That's the joy too of research. Yes. Um, Christian, what is a sound that brings you comfort as you listen? Oh, bird song. Bird song, cat purr, um, leaves, wind in the trees. Well, I think they're the sea. They're all obvious ones, but I think the act is really to open up your attention so that you don't just have them coming and sublimely and, and, and sort of nourishing you, but that you actually turn to them. And in, a, in that the phrase of that last section, listen to the music of what happens. Thank you. Uh, Richard, uh, out of time periods, what interested you in writing? What made you lean towards uh, the medieval, towards medieval Europe? Um, it's, it's close enough that we have some entry into understanding it. Um, I'm, I'm interested in ancient periods as well, but say when I read Greek tragedy, I think, whoa, this world is, the understanding of the world here is wildly different from our own. Um, when the gods are capricious and mean, and you're just trying to keep them from killing you all the time. It's very different from the major Western religions. But the medieval period is close enough that we have some way of understanding, distant enough that it's exotic. Um, and um, I'm also sort of interested in the whole question of how we got to Shakespeare. So the medieval period is part of that. And especially the late medieval period was so um, active and disruptive and chaotic mm -hmm. and full of change. So it's fascinating. Thank you. Christian, what chapter from In Praise of Listening was the most surreal or personal to you? Wow. Well, probably the boldest was the one about communing with the dead, listening to the those who've gone ahead. Um, but I I got a great deal out of the, the little sounds of every day. One of the people I interviewed was what's, was what's called a forensic listener. Literally, um, he listened to audio tapes of, of of delicate moments where somebody might, where they were actually trying to find a criminal. Um, he's he, yeah he's called, called he listens to what are called forensic re recordings. So you hear a ticking clock, you hear a passing plane, you hear a bird song. What does that tell you about where this recording was made and who's who was present there? So that was fascinating to me uh, that you could actually listen to use sound as a as a as a detect as a detective. I would never have expected that. 
Thank you. Um, so uh, I believe this is for you, Richard. What do what what do you recommend for someone who is not a native English speaker but has an interest in exploring sonnets? Uh, what would you recommend starting with, maybe? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, there are anthologies of sonnets that are out there that go from the beginning of the sonnet in English form to the present day. That would be a good place to start. Um, and I, if this person wants to get in touch with me on my website, richardsmithwriting.com, you can send me an email and I will, I have a couple of those books and I'd be glad to send those references to the person. Obviously Shakespeare is great, but the if you're not a native speak, speaker, it takes a while to get accustomed to that, that language since it's so remote from the present. Thank you. Um, for Christian, uh, Naomi Shihab Nye teaches about the words under words. Uh, I'm curious what you might say about listening under listening. Well, that forensic listener was doing that in the sense that he was listening to the human conversation that was recorded in the tape, and he was listening to the background sounds of the place where the tape was made. So there was a layering of listening. And there was an extraordinary story when I interviewed him. This man was called Alan Herson, where he heard two people talking and they were two men talking and they, the, the words that they'd spoken had been transcribed. But what nobody had paid attention to was that there was a woman and a child behind the two men speaking. And the little child was saying to the mama that the the boiled egg was too weak, was too runny, and he didn't like it, and he want, didn't want to eat it. Um, and and no, again, nobody had paid attention to this querulous child. But at a certain point, the kids said, where's daddy? And the mother said, daddy's upstairs. And daddy was the drug dealer they were trying to track down. And so because they listened, but beyond the <laughs> immediate layer of words, they discovered um, an answer they thought they had really not any chance of finding. Thank you. Uh, for Christian, again, since you're not American, but have lived here a long time, what have you learned about Americans from listening to us? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I mean, I come from a culture where people like to like to tell talk in stories. And, and and in this country, people are more psychologically oriented. So when they, they intimacy is a matter of sort of trading interior troubles often or, in, or interior issues. Whereas where I'm from, people are more likely not to trade those interior issues, but to, to talk, to tell, to talk story to each other. That's great, thank you. I believe we've made it through the questions in the chat. So I believe, and it's right a little after three. So it seems like it's a good time to say thank you to Richard and Christian. Um, and uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. So thank you so much. This was, I hope everyone here enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, Richard, Christian, please stay familiar with the Writer Center. We hope we'll, we'll cross paths with you again and again and again. And thanks for the rest of you coming out and please join us again soon in, in the future.